for The Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. You know, what struck me as I was reflecting on 9-11, as I was speaking about reconciliation, an act of aggression was occurring. The second one was in the way in which we responded and reacted to this as a nation and many of us individually. In some sense, already at the moment of memory, a revenge has an attempt to right and to the wrong and exterminate the evil out of the world that has led to something like that had already taken root in our in ourselves and i think that it's this reaction to the violation that has stayed with me for such a long time reflecting on you know what, what incredible cost that reaction has inflicted the the trauma that we've experienced costs us and costs the world I- immensely this is for the life of the world a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity i'm evan rosa with the yale center for faith and culture hello friends Thanks for listening to For the Life of the World. Today marks the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And for those of us who were old enough to remember where we were 20 years ago this morning, it's become kind of a flashbulb memory. It's one of those unique memories where at a particular day and at a particular time, many of us can reconstruct where we were, what we were doing, sometimes in surprising detail. It's stamped on our individual and collective consciousness. But on this 20-year remembrance of 9-11, it's significant to reflect not just on what occurred that morning 20 years ago, but everything that has occurred since, everything that has stamped our individual and collective consciences. I asked Miroslav Wolf to come on the show today to reflect on his own memory of where he was on 9-11, because as the first plane was crashing into the World Trade Center, Miroslav was giving an address at the UN headquarters along the East River in Manhattan just blocks away from ground zero. Mr. President, Mr. Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my honor to address you today on the day of the opening of a new session of the General Assembly. It is appropriate in this place where you do such important and tireless work to resolve many of the conflicts that rage around the world for us to come before God and ask for God's wisdom and God's guidance. It is also appropriate, I think, for the theme of my talk to be reconciliation. Allow me to start by drawing your attention to the character of the world in which we live. As the first plane shook the first tower and smoke rose into the sky, Miroslav was quoting Romanian Jewish poet Paul Salon, specifically his poem Death Fugue, which paints a dark picture of human suffering during the Holocaust and the living death that was the concentration camps. Black milk of daybreak. We drink it at evening. We drink it at midday and morning. We shovel a grave in the air. There you won't lie all too cramped. Miroslav went on to outline the features of reconciliation as embrace. Embrace, he said that morning, is the horizon of the struggle for justice. You will have justice Only if you strive for something greater than justice. Only if you strive after love. In this episode, we begin by talking about his experience of that morning 20 years ago, listening to a few short clips from his UN remarks, and we consider the lasting impact of 9-11 on both American and global life, and how the event and its continuing aftermath have shaped the world. Thanks for listening, friends. Miroslav, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast this week for a commemoration, really, of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. It's good to be with you here, Evan. Your story of where you were on 9-11 is pretty remarkable. I wonder if you'd recount some of that. Where were you on 9-11 and how did you find out about the attacks? Well, at that day, I was in New York. I was early in the morning speaking at the prayer breakfast meeting at the United Nations. Uh, I was at the UN building itself inside the UN, 
and I was addressing a group of Christians for all, from all vocations of life from many countries gathered gathered there, and I was giving the main address. That was at 10 o'clock in the morning, present from Japan, peace gong was to be sounded, and thus the, I believe it was 56th assembly to be opened. How did you actually find out about the attacks? I mean, it was that morning, right? Yeah, it happened that morning, and I was actually speaking, and I f- saw what I thought were security personnel coming through the back door of the room where I was speaking. It was a prayer breakfast, so it was more like a set of tables spread spread out. And I knew something must have happened. And as soon as I had finished uh, speaking, they have immediately stepped up and said, you need to evacuate the building right away with not much explanation given as far as I could uh, recall. Wow. Did they cut your speech short? No, they waited until I completely finished. And I think I finished with a quoting from Paul Salon's death fugue, if I'm not mistaken. And then they stepped in and ushered us very quickly out. And it's only then that I realized uh, what had happened. I think by that time, only first the plane has hit uh, the tower. Mm. And very soon thereafter, the second was to fall. Black milk of daybreak. We drink it at evening. We drink it at midday and morning. We drink it at night. We drink and we drink. We shovel a grave in the air. There you won't lie all too cramped. A man lives in the house. He plays with his vipers. He writes... He writes when it grows dark to Germany of your golden-haired margarita. He writes it and steps out of doors and the stars are all sparkling. He whistles his juice into rows. He has them shovel a grave in the ground. He commands us, play up for the dance. Let's talk a little bit about that poem. I mean... This poem in particular, and of course, the substance of your talk that morning on reconciliation really is the remarkable element here that, that you would, that this, that these two things would correlate that your talk on reconciliation and, and the recitation of death fugue, which speaks about shoveling a grave in the air. Yes, obviously, I couldn't have known uh, any of what would uh, transpire. And in some ways, you may think reconciliation is the right theme, uh, especially given my background, my writing and my interest in reconciliation. And given where we were, the United Nations challenge of living together in diverse settings and the small conflicts and larger wars was present. But I certainly could not have in any ways anticipated how relevant the death fugue would be. It speaks, of course, about, it's a poem about Holocaust, yeah. about Auschwitz, and shoveling the grave in the air. In some ways, it, it, it describes the gas chambers and the burned bodies that are going up into, into the air. And that's, in a sense, what has happened. Resonances were present. I mean, yeah, the sort of dual images of ash surrounding Auschwitz and ash surrounding the World Trade Center. I mean, it's, of course, we can't compare the two events. I mean, they're both unique in their historical, historical toll and the cost of human life that, that was involved in, in both. But really, I mean, you used these words, these verses to describe the reality of brutality and exclusion in the world and, and trying to call attention to the really dire context that that is the human condition that that does find itself so tempted toward exclusion and brutality and violence yeah in some sense i think holocaust was was a unique certainly unique yeah. magnitude ferocity of evil mm-hmm. the kind of an event but also it indicated sketch the horizon of darkest of possibilities for us and on small scale similar atrocities have happened in many uh, places uh, in, in the world and then this being the 20th anniversary 
of, of this collective American trauma of 9-11. The fact is, it also marks the 20th anniversary of the longest American war and the kind of brutality and, and violence that war leaves makes such a lasting imprint on the human community. Of course, not all of us are exposed to this. You've been exposed to it in your own life, but this is really a commemoration of a very painful memory, a memory that seems to kind of repeat itself yearly when the country turns to memorials and reflections on 9-11, but has stayed with other people and other global communities in Afghanistan. And these pain, painful memories are there. How can our country and, and how can the world deal with these painful memories? And what role does Christian theology have? You, you know, what struck me is I was reflecting on 9-11 and how 9-11 was not not even remembered, you may put it, but perceived, which is to say how it was read very soon after it occurred. In some ways, I, I thought that I my talk at the UN experienced dual misconfirmation. <laughs> huh. Say more about that. Dual crossing. And one crossing, obviously, was an obvious one. That is to say, as I was speaking about reconciliation, an act of aggression was occurring. The second one was in the way in which we responded and reacted to this as a nation and many of us individually. In some sense, already at the moment of memory, a revenge has an attempt to right and to the wrong and exterminate the evil out of the world that has led to something like that had already taken root in our in ourselves and i think that it's this reaction to the violation that has stayed with me for such a long time reflecting on you know what, what incredible cost that reaction has inflicted the the trauma that we've experienced cost us and cost the world I immensely and you mentioned two wars and and more those that have happened and I, I'm thinking well that from my perspective and I know that a lot of people especially maybe on 20th anniversary of 9/11 might disagree with this but from my in my judgment these were, and certainly Iraq war in Afghanistan, were unjust wars, hmm. which is to say they were also unchristian wars, which is to say that they were themselves, without denying the evil of attack, they themselves represented as a moral action an evil. And that's an incredible thing to do in response to evil, to commit another one. That seems to be kind of a moral cost of violation of another, other people in the process of hoping to right the wrong or, pardon my French, as our president has said, to kick some ass. And it's really this expression that, that captures the animus behind and a certain kind of moral uh, emptiness uh, of it. Yeah. But, but it struck me also that it's not just the, the moral cost in this regard, namely an unjust war. But I think that somewhere I have read that the wars in the Middle East after 9-11 have cost our country $6.4 trillion. It's unfathomable. <laughs> that is an absolutely, I, mean, yeah. I don't know whether that's true. Uh, let's say it's half of yeah, that. Sure. It's much more. But if you think, what a waste of resources hmm. that could have been done, could have been used to do a great deal of good yeah. in, in the world. And mm -hmm. I feel that, that, that the burden of what we haven't done with 6.4 trillion, the good that we haven't done, it weighs on the moral conscience as well as that it took so much in order to commit the evil that we did. Yeah. The moral injury that follows from these 20 years it's less a flash bulb event for for folks because such a long war numbs a person to its very existence but it's fascinating to think about your comments about the american response following 9-11 through that 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 slogan that that came up 
almost immediately after 9-11, which is never forget. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to, of course, we want to never forget in a kind of memorialization of those we've lost, but it's, it inflected so differently when you see it through the lens of revenge and that never forgetting is a kind of never reconciling, never embracing. Yeah, I mean, you put it quite uh, well. And after 9-11, I have tried to articulate some of what you've just said in in the book, The End of Memory. So it's not the question of how we remember. It's not a question of whether we should remember or not. And uh, I certainly do not want to contest the claim that we should not uh, forget. I might contest the claim that we should never forget, but we certainly should remember and memorialize. But everything depends on what we do with our memories, how we frame our memories. And the memories have not only a, a kind of cognitive side, kind of knowledge side, this is what happened, but they have also a pragmatic side. And it's that pragmatic side, you use the word inflection. They were inflected in order to do certain, uh, a certain thing in the world. That is to say, in order to motivate action of taking a certain kind of revenge or doing justice that turned out not to be justice that, to, that turned out to be unjust. Yeah. So key for me there is how one remembers, because if one remembers wrongly, our memories themselves become a source of conflict. We can see that in many parts of the world where conflicts are always motivated by remembered past. Yeah. And how one remembers past then is central to whether those conflicts are going to be continued, whether they're going to be uh, attended to with just or unjust means, and hence the memory becomes a fundamental issue for us. In, in your UN talk, you talk about these two kinds of reconciliation, because the, the, that's where you're going ultimately with that talk that you gave, just as, as that first plane was was crashing into the first building. You first you outline these two different kinds of reconciliation. There's cheap reconciliation where really like the status quo remains. We never deal with injustices done. Don't rock the boat. Just keep things secure. And then there's a, another kind of failure of reconciliation where first you try to find justice and only then after justice would you try to seek reconciliation. Now both of these are insufficient and I'm not going to ask you to spell these out, but you do qualify a kind of reconciliation as embrace that offers a positive vision for what healing can be in a violent world. It's the how, right? So you talk about that how we remember is such an important factor. As an alternative to these two unacceptable ways to understand reconciliation by relating it to justice, I want to look at the resources that lie at the very heart of the Christian tradition. At this center, we find the narrative, the story, the event of the cross of Christ as an act of reconciliation of God with humanity. On the cross of Christ, God is manifested as the God who, though in no way indifferent toward the distinction between good and evil, nonetheless lets the sun shine on both the good and the evil as the God of infinite and indiscriminate love who died for the ungodly in order to bring them into divine communion, the God who offers grace even to the vilest evildoer. And I wanted to start there with the will to embrace because you describe it as unconditional. You describe it with reference to God, the kind of indiscriminate, and infinite love that God offers. So those words, infinite, indiscriminate, and unconditional, they really stand out to me as a kind of description for that will to embrace. And many people, when they listen to you talk, when they listen to me uh, talk and mention those uh, words, don't know quite how, how to react and consider them to be inappropriate, consider them to be betrayal of justice. And I certainly have sympathies with that. Uh, On the other hand, I have really deep commitments to the Christian faith and to the kind of life that Christ embodied. And if one has those kinds of commitments, then the only possible way to 
respond to a violation is not to simply react, but to relate to a violator in such a way that at the minimum, their humanity is recognized. The evil deed has not dehumanized the person. Nothing can dehumanize the person because person is the person held as a human in God's hands. Hmm. And second step related uh, to this is that love is called upon for a person, no matter what they have done. Their humanity and love uh, are central. Now, from there, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it then mean to love somebody who, as a human being, has in many ways betrayed their very humanity that is still being affirmed. Mm -hmm. And the steps toward reconciliation, we can go through them. Uh, Sometimes it's necessary to to isolate the the person in a sense, not to allow them to continue Mm. permitting the kinds of deeds that they have already once uh, once permitted. Mm. In other words, something like discipline seems to me quite appropriate. You have uh, kids and I have uh, small kids. There's such thing as time out. And those are very good things. There are other forms of disciplines that are very good things because their goal is to help the person return back to themselves and to the good from which they have fallen and help them not to continue on the same path and then hurt hurt other people. And it seems to me that it's this kind of stance that is essential for reconciliation, namely to appreciate the humanity and love the person as a person and try to find ways in which to return them back from from the, the, the betrayal of the good which they have committed. The will to embrace another person is unconditional. The will to embrace precedes any truth about others and any construction of their justice. Truth and justice are preconditions of actual embrace. Unless you will to embrace the other and be reconciled to her, you will not find what is truth and what is justice. For you can always interpret somebody's outwardly generous action as a covertly violent action, as a bouquet of flowers in which a dagger is hidden. You have to want to see the other's goodness in order to actually perceive it, provided, of course, that the other actually does manifest goodness. Embrace is the horizon of the struggle for justice. You will have justice only if you strive for something greater than justice, only if you strive after love. You say also in the talk that embrace is the horizon of the struggle for justice and that you'll only have justice if you strive for something greater than justice, only if you strive after love. I wonder if you'd just comment on that as kind of some closing reflections on the lasting impact of of 9-11 on faith and culture in American and global life. Yeah. So, so it's one of the one of the impacts which I wanted to mention possibly, and that's a, a kind of retroactive effect that nine eleven has had on American Christians, especially mm-hmm. evangelical American Christians. I, I think that was one of the factors in the rise of, of Christian uh, nationalism, which, again, from the perspective of the faith of Christ. It is a profound distortion of faith. In some ways, I speak yeah. in that address, in that speech, also the reasons why religion is deployed in a violent way, uh, serves as a legitimation of a violence. And that reason is too close of an association of a faith with a particular political project, with the life of the nation as a whole, an absence then of critical distance on the basis of faith mm-hmm. from the political uh, community. Yeah. And if one observes what has happened after 9-11, effects were such that you had the transformation almost of a American Christianity 
evangelical Christianity into something that has stepped away from the foundations of faith in the Gospels and in the life uh, life of Christ. And that seems to me to be consequence of 9-11 that we don't talk very often, but that it is a profoundly has profound effects and will continue to have profound uh, effects, not in, simply in terms of the loss of Christian substance by the people who take these kinds of stances, but also in the loss of ability to transmit faith to younger generations Mm. who find that this kind of association of faith and uh, a nation is deeply problematic. In my experience, however, Christianity is a factor in conflict when it is regarded as primarily a cultural resource, a marker of a particular group identity, in the name of which they then struggle against another group, rather than as the living faith of individuals and of whole communities. And when there is only a superficial, though not necessarily lukewarm, relationship to that faith, when one has not been inducted into it, sustained and nurtured, by a long-standing tradition of that faith. One last question. You, you end your UN talk with a call to creativity. I want to leave you with invitation to creativity. I don't have time to suggest how you would acquire the will to embrace or practice embrace in concrete situations, whether your personal or in your more communal lives. I pray that God will grant you wisdom to find creative ways to practice embrace in our world shot through with violence. Ultimately, the work of embrace, the will to embrace and the practice of it in concrete situations requires a kind of creative wisdom in the life of the individual. Where have you seen that, and how would you? How do you think about that today, twenty years later? Yes, I, I think um, more. Actually, I try to practice embrace in my my own life. More, I am cognizant that the no situation is the same. That a clear rules how to proceed cannot be formulated, but that it requires attentiveness to the particularity of the situation, to the character of person with whom you are engaging. And that then means a certain kind of sympathetic identification with the person or empathetic also identification uh, with the person and at the same time a sense of how one might be perceived by them and why one might have been the target of the kind of action that one was when one was violated. We have life in the imagination of others. And so when we empathize with them, we we thematize also this life that we have in imagination uh, with with others. That requires uh, creativity. That's situation specific. That requires improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if I want to speak in this, uh, put it in a Christian form of uh, language, the the spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom, spirit uh, of the new Mm. openness for the new situation to realize the great good of the life of Christ being lived in us. Miroslav, thanks so much for joining me today and sharing some of these reflections 20 years years ago. It's amazing that it's been that long. Thank you for your words here. It is painful to remember these things, but it is good to think about them. Yeah, thanks. of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured theologian Miroslav Wolf, production assistance by Martin Chan and Nathan Jowers. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, with the occasional midweek. If you're new to the show, we're so glad that you found us. Remember to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you've been listening for a while, thank you, friends. 
If you're liking what you're hearing, I've got a request. Would you support us? It's pretty simple, really, and won't take much time. Here are some ideas. First, you could hit the share button for this episode in your app and send a text or email to a friend or share it to your social feed. Second, you could give us an honest rating on Apple Podcasts. How are we really doing? Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are cool because they'll help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about and what's most meaningful to you, our listeners. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.